and be able to come up and just enter into the, to the message and not have to change gears. And more than that, not have to sit down. We're making progress with this, by the way, but continue to pray for me. I'll be back on my feet in a few minutes here. I just needed to sit down for a bit. It's okay. You can still see me, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, we thank God for uh, being able to share ministry with others and uh, tell Joe he's missed. Um, my wife recently, and much to her chagrin, lost her monitor. And by lost, I mean we were away for a day or two and we came back and one of the frequent power outages in this neighborhood that we learned about uh, fried something. And her computer was fine, but her monitor was non-functional. And we tried some shortcuts suggested by my son, and they didn't help either. So, her husband bit the bullet, and we ordered <laughs> a replacement, uh, which was not, so to speak, in the budget. But uh, God has been made the work. And it, it arrived yesterday, and I had already elicited a promise from her because we had things to do. That, you know, when it gets here, just let it sit, get the other things done. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> and it didn't. She had to know, you know, would it work? Was it actually, at the end of the day, a problem in her computer and not in the monitor? It works. But it got me thinking about uh, all the years of advancing technology. And one of the things that I remember is back in the old days, everything came with a manual. Now sometimes you buy it and you have to go online to get the manual and so many pages you would never print it out. And one thing has not changed, these manuals are useless. If you've ever tried, they're, they're useless. They're written by people who sometimes didn't speak English as their first language, they speak engineer. And uh, you check the, the tables of contents and you don't find anything remotely sounding like your problem name. So you go to the index and you don't find anything remotely, ah, here's something close, well look at that. We read for four or five pages and discover it has nothing to do with our problem. And so finally you call the company and, and they say, you know, try online. You get online, which in some cases if you could do, you wouldn't need to call them. That's one of my favorite things. You call them and you say, I have this problem. Well, you know, you can check, it, check this out online. If my computer was working, I could do that. And then you get there and they have those FAQs, frequently asked mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed you never identify with a single question on that list? <laughs> you, you can't find your problem, ever. Uh, it's so frustrating. Uh, and technology for some, like myself, is so far beyond me that it just, I just have to accept the fact that I'm going to be frustrated and cultivate friendships with people who are not. <laughs> and that's what I do. I learned to admit my shortcomings and pick up the phone and say, <laughs> into the phone. Uh, sometimes when we turn our attention to scriptures, we can feel the same way. We read something and we're going, what is this saying? I don't, I don't, I don't get it, I don't get it. And some people would have other people think that that's the way the Bible is throughout. Well, there are ways of addressing the difficult portions, reliance on the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of good Christian men who have taught before and are still teaching. Uh, but never forget that some if not all of the most important things God wants you to know are crystal clear in Scripture. And you will find that the enemy knows this too. And so he tries to cloud the waters. God has given the gathering only two directives for what it does corporately as when it comes together as a body. Okay, When the gathering is actually gathered, in other words. And one is that we should remember him, and the other is that those who have recently come to faith should be baptized. 
And it's kind of one of the amazing things about the scripture because if, if the scriptures were written to be a manual for religion, it would have told us all of those things, like how many prayers there should be, what the music should be like, how long the service should last, etc., etc. God left those things completely up to people and cultures to use their time, their space, their situation to worship God in a way that best expressed their worship to him. Now, singing is encouraged uh, in, in uh, Ephesians. Uh, preaching the word is expected. Okay? But the parameters for that, so to speak, the, the boundaries, that they don't exist. And uh, so we, as human beings, supply them. It's called liturgy. And liturgy is not always bad. So I'm not, I'm not going down that road. But it is sometimes an attempt to rein ourselves in so that the spontaneity of the spirit is not present among us. And that's what we have to be careful with in anything we do. Even the order of service that we generally use here can become handcuffs on our worship, right? It can get in the way of uh, our responding to the Holy Spirit with immediacy and joy and celebration. So we don't want that. And we also don't want people putting um, uh, uh, barriers between us and the simple things. And these, these directives that Jesus gave are quite simple. Quite simple. Uh, there is the direction that we should do what we just did and remember him. What could be more, more simple? Keep it simple? Keep it simple. So instead we have arguments about frequency. I won't argue, but I'm personally all for weekly remembrance. It tends to take a different shape when you do it every week and maybe somewhere down the line we can talk these things through. But I don't judge people who do it monthly, quarterly, whatever, so long as they're doing it. I would have problems with a church that ignored what the Lord said and no longer remembered him in this way. That I would have a problem with, because the scripture is clear. Um, we argue about what it means. And I think uh, one of the great reformers, a man named Swingley, was the one who got it most right. He said, after all of those passages in which Jesus says things exactly in the same structure of I am this or I am that or this is this, and this um, such as Jesus said, I am the gate or I am the door, depending on your translation. Does any of us expect to see Jesus with hinges, panes, and a doorknob or lock? Of course not. We understand what is called a metaphor, an image. He is a door in the sense that you go, you enter into the kingdom of God passing through him, through, through his work, through what he did on the cross. In that manner, he's a door. But no hinges, no frame, no lock, no door. Right? So when Jesus said, this is my body, it's a metaphor. It, you might even call it a parable with objects. He taught parables all the time, didn't he? Same thing. We're never invited to, to question whether the parables were stories or accounts of something that actually happened. And I don't argue with people no matter what they think. If they think they, Jesus is telling an account, that's fine with me. If Jesus is, has composed an illustration, that's fine with me. As long as you listen to the truth that's being taught. And it's the same thing with the Lord's Supper. Uh, there's no reason to try and complicate it by explaining in what way the bread is Jesus, because it's a metaphor, it's a picture, it's a parable. But there are some things that are very, very important. Uh, first of all, know that uh, just for your own study, each of what are called the Synoptic Gospels, the first three Gospels are called that because of their similar approach to reporting the story of Jesus. And I'll save that for another time. But uh, John is, to anybody's eyes, a different format, a different approach to telling the story. Not a different truth, 
not a different uh, understanding. Uh, he just is focused on those things which reveal Jesus as God. Uh, and the other three also have a focus. Matthew uh, focuses on Jesus as the fulfillment of all the messianic promises. Mark focuses on Jesus as the servant that was promised. Luke, um, he's more interested, they, there's another thing they sign, but I find he's mostly interested in the emotions that Christ had and that those around him had. He's, a, he's very attuned to those things. So he's the one, for instance, who says the most about women because he was interested in people. So it wasn't just the men who spoke that interested him. It was the women that Jesus interacted with as well. And so he reports on all these emotional things. And I love that, uh, that epistle for that reason. And of course, we mentioned earlier 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And so those chapters, if you're taking notes, it's Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, 1 Corinthians 11. These are the places where we have the words of institution. They're not all exactly the same, but they don't contradict each other, which is normally what we have with the Gospels. One reports one story, the other one leaves it out. One uh, gives part of what Jesus said, one gives you more of what Jesus said. Uh, and so they're, they're each a little bit different, uh, but I, as I said, none of them contradict one another. So on the matter of the bread, we could combine the general statements and come up with this, which is not identical to anyone, but incorporate them all. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now that phrase, in remembrance, which is on our new cloth up here, um, is more tangibly, I think, uh, translated as a memorial of, of me or for me. Uh, that's how the word was used. If uh, people in Jesus' time put up a statue of General so-and-so, Emperor such-and-such, -such, it was referred to as that same word, a memorial, a remembrance, something that when you passed it by brought that individual, living or dead, to mind. And so what Jesus... Uh, is teaching, even as he gives us this act of worship, is that um, we need a memorial. We're forgetful people. You know? Go over to Fairmount Park someday, and I may have said this to you before, but go over to Fairmount Park someday and look at all the statues. And read. Find out how many of them you don't even know who these people are without reading the plaque. And others, you see the name on the plaque, and you go, oh, that's who it is. Why? Because... No matter how great somebody's contribution may be, we tend to forget them. And if the history of the situation was written slightly skewed, Rusty and I were talking about um, Edison versus Tesla today, uh, we only, many of us only now, in the last decade or so, have become familiar with who Tesla is and the great role he had in bringing electric, electricity to us and all of the other things that, that, as an inventor, was more significant than what Edison did. Um, so now we have books and we can go and we can read about those things. They are a, a memorial. What is a, more, a memorial of, though? And, and I want to be really clear on this because um, there is undeniably a memorial here of the life and death of Jesus Christ. And I'll fill that in just a minute. The life and death of but when he says uh, that you're to do this as a memorial of me, he never once says of my death and resurrection. In fact, when he gave these words, those things had not taken place yet. He said, I want you to remember me. And I think one of the things that flows our, and when I say our, I'm talking about evangelicals in general, use of this ordinance is it's narrowed down to saying words and praying prayers and passing stuff around and we don't really get to the heart of remembering him 
We do not surround this event with memories of him. The most important thing that Jesus did for us, of course, was to die and rise again. Bearing our sin and conquering sin and death in his resurrection. It's, not, it's undeniable. That's the most important thing. Is that the only thing? Well, for one thing, he could never have given himself and then risen again if he hadn't taken on human form. So the incarnation is very important. And everything related to the fact of his humanity as well as his divinity is very important. And when I remember him, I should remember some of those things. And yet in his humanity, how he demonstrated his divinity is very important too. We don't walk on water. He did. <laughs> we don't feed 5,000 people from diddly and squat. He did. Am I allowed to say diddly and squat from the pulpit? Okay. <laughs> we used to be much more prim and proper when I practiced this kind of furniture, you know. Um, but uh, we, need to, we need to come and let the Holy Spirit lead us in memory of these things uh, because that's when, not only when we fulfill Jesus' intent for this, but it's also when we get the benefit of it. If we were stored in our memories of the power of Christ, maybe two days out of worship when we come into difficulty in our lives, we'll remember that there is one who loved us, gave himself for us, and is coming again to receive us to himself, who's so powerful I can cast my cares on him, knowing he cares for me, and something will happen that's positive and good. Paul would say, believers, we know that all things work together for good for those that love Christ, right? Everything. But if we forget that that happens because Christ is all of those things that, that the Gospels reveal to us, all of the things that were anticipated in the Old, Old Testament, all of those things that are explored in the epistles, we're left to deal with life struggles on our own. When I don't know my way out of a situation, it's good to remember that he is the good shepherd who protects his sheep, who calls them by name. This is an opportunity when we come to the Lord's Supper to remember him, the things that he taught, the things that he did. And of course, his death and resurrection. He says that the body is given what? For you. As we remember, we realize that what Jesus did was for us. So we can have the confidence that not only does he have the power to do what we need him to do, not only does he have uh, the wisdom to explain to us what we need to have explained, but he gave his life for us. There's nothing he's going to hold back from us. Right? Scripture asks, he who spared not, now I was talking about the Father, but he who spared not his own son, how shall he not with him give freely, give you all things? If God held nothing back, which is what we can see here, then we can be pretty confident that he's going to continue to hold nothing back and bring to us whatever is for our need and for our good. The cup. Composite there would be something like, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is, and we find this only in Matthew, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And again, we're told to do this and remember remembrance of him. To me, the, the body speaks primarily of his life. The body that he took on to live for us so that he could die for us. But there is no doubt that the cup represents his death. You know, I'll, I'll dialogue with you on this one, but the cup obviously represents his death. And the writer of Hebrews teaches us without the shedding of blood there is no release of sin. There's no remission of sins. There's no forgiveness of sins. But any translation in there you want. But we can be free from our sins only because the divine blood of Christ has flowed in his perfection on behalf of us who deserve, or we, us, who deserve to be uh, 
receiving the punishment that he took in our place. It was a death for our forgiveness. Sometimes we show up at worship in a defeated mode. It's been a bad week. <laughs> we made some dumb decisions. We did some wrong things. And we wonder, can I really sit here as a Christian and, and, and pretend? Well, you don't have to pretend. Because the Savior died. And John makes it clear that what Jesus taught on the night in which he was with his disciples, that you are clean because of what he does for us. Only your feet need to be washed. Remember that? Why? Because we, we're still in this world. We still muck up. So what does John tell us in his first epistle? 1 John 1, 9. If we, now that's Christians. That verse is written for believers. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we look at the blood, we realize that God can give us a new start each and every day. And we probably need a new start each and every day. But I want to focus just for a minute on those two words in 1 John 1 9. He is faithful. What does that mean? That means there's no exception to this rule that John is about to give. Right? You can count on it if you come honestly before the Lord and from, a, from an open heart confess those things that you have done wrong. He is never going to say, no, you crossed over this time. I'm not going to forgive you. Because he provided complete forgiveness at the cross. So he's faithful. He's going he's to forgive. But he's also just. Why? Because he paid the price at the cross. He can forgive us, not because our sins are um, of no consequence, not because they don't matter, not because it's no big deal. It was a very big deal. He died on the cross. But it's done. It's done. So he can justly, he can righteously, he can fairly, if you will, forgive us yet again <coughs> because the forgiveness is And then it's good news the rest of the verse, and it cleanses, takes that baggage and washes it away. You know, he's not like that person, that, that friend of yours, that sister, brother, and I mean, in the flesh, uh, or whatever, who said, well, I'll forgive you, but I'm not going to forget. That means in their eyes, it's, the problem is still there. They said the words that somehow they feel obligated to say. But they're still seeing the individual through the laws of their sin. Jesus doesn't do that. Forgiven? Where does he say he puts our sins? As far as the east is from the west. As far as the east is from the west, in the depths of the sea. All kinds of metaphors all over scripture. It's gone. We used to sing a little chorus about that. You remember gone? Gone, gone, gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Buried in the sea and in my heart's a song. Buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. I shall live eternally. Praise God. They're gone. We remember the goneness, if you will, of our sins when we remember him who gave his life for us. So at the table, pride is condemned because it's all about him. And sin's at times are laid bare because we see here again the price that he paid for us. And the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart. But also here, by confession, we can be renewed and restored to him. There are just three other things I'm going to mention real quickly. They could be whole topics on their own, but I'm not going to do that to you today. And I, I came here prepared not to do that, by the way. So I'm not cutting anything short. But uh, each of the accounts makes mention of the fact that uh, Jesus told them that he was not going to drink from the cup of the vine again until when? Till the kingdom come. Till the kingdom come. Well, uh, you know, this 
Ordinance is a past, present, and future kind of thing. In the past, we remember Jesus for who he was and what he did. In the present, we commune with him. We, we, we renew our fellowship with him and with one another. Uh, and, in the, and then we look to the future because Christ is coming again. And we need to live with an expectancy of that. Uh, that that is, is like the taste you get in your mouth when something good is baking in the oven. It's not finished yet, you can't eat it, but you know it's going to be good because it smells so terrific. Well, the coming of Christ is better than a smell. It's better than a feeling. It is an eternal hope, and it is ours and ours alone by Christ. And you should taste it. You should anticipate it regularly. And then the third thing, and we'll finish, comes from uh, Paul's reiteration of the words of institution uh, in his account. Uh, and I, I, as I read it, these are Paul's words, not something that he heard that Jesus said then and he's sharing with us now. Which is okay. If that's, I mean, he's a divinely inspired apostle. But I think this comes, in a sense, interpretation of things. He says, "For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes." Now, I want you to understand that is not for the saints the purpose of this ordinance. I can't say that all. It's not the purpose of this ordinance. It is a byproduct. And represents the fact that uh, Paul expected, and he talks about it elsewhere in the period, that there would be people who have not yet come to faith in the worship service. Who, as we talk about, as we open up. As so, what I want to do is challenge you in the future uh, to come as deeply prepared as you possibly can through the week, through the month between times. Get that Jesus journal going that I keep encouraging you. And I'm not a journaler myself, but I have a computer and I jot these things down. You know, when, when you remember something about the goodness of your God, write it down. And we'll provide more and more time for the sharing of these things each time we gather at the Lord's table. We'll remember it together. We'll remember what he has done, not what we did, or not what we want done, but what he did, and what he uh, can be expected to continue to do in the life of those who trust him. Father God, we thank you for the witness of scripture, but we thank you for the creative way in which you deal with our humanity, so that we have not only words, but music, not only music, but tangible acts that we can do uh, to bring forward from our hearts the worship that is due to the Christ who died. Thank you, Father. May your spirit do this work in us in days to come in a special, powerful way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.